Hey everybody, Rob D'Alessio. Today I've got Kyle Thomas, executive chef and owner of La Chandelure Restaurant, and he's going to show us how to make something that I've never made before, a chorizo twist crepe. Come on, let's get started. All right, so today I brought in my good friend Kyle Thomas. He's the executive chef and the owner of La Chandelure in the south end of Louisville, the beautiful neighborhood of Beachmont. Now, Kyle, explain to me, how are we gonna pull this off, this chorizo crepe? You know, that's multiple ingredients, a lot of things going on. Tell me what we're gonna do. Yes, absolutely. So our chorizo itself has a crazy amount of ingredients. As you can see, it's all sort of laid out right here. And essentially, we stick it all together in this bowl, as far as all the spices go. Stir it together so there's no clumps and then stick all the meat and then all the spices in this mixer and just let it go for a few minutes until it's nice and, and even. Well, let's get started. The first thing we're gonna do is add all of our spices. Uh, the first thing we have here is ancho chili. We have a whole lot of garlic powder. Here, that was clove. Right. We've got cinnamon. We've got paprika and coriander. Salt, obviously. Some oregano and some white pepper. So the reason why we suck all this in the bowl first is so we can mix it all together in our vinegar so that it's not all clumpy when it goes into the mixer with the meat. Because the, that's not what you want in a huge hunk of meat is also a huge hunk of, say, garlic powder. So you're kind of making a slurry right there? Yeah. And you used, was that apple cider vinegar? That was apple cider vinegar. Is that traditional to use that or is that something that you do yourself or that you came to yourself? So there's a couple kinds of chorizo. Um, there's a green chorizo and a red chorizo. And yes, as far as the usual vinegar that's in red chorizo, it is gonna be apple cider. So where'd you learn how to make chorizo? I, gosh, I spent some, some time in several restaurants around town. I've worked at uh, Jack Fry's, Proof on Me, and I was at Wild Eggs for a while. And I just learned a lot from everywhere. So you went to culinary school here in town, Sullivan yes. University. Was that like, when you first started there, was it kind of like deer in the headlights, like, oh my gosh, this is so much, I don't know if I'll be able to get it all, or it all, you just kind of took to, did you cook growing up? Yes, I did cook growing up a lot, um, but it was more so like, I'd help my mom make the macaroni, or I'd like, uh, say flip burgers on a grill. Sure. Um, that was always fun to me, but yeah, whenever I hit culinary school, it was more so like, holy crap. Right? This is a lot. It's not just applying heat to things. There's a lot more to it than Absolutely. that. Absolutely. All right, so what do we got going on here? So we've got ground pork. Yes. And then we have, is that ground chuck or? Uh, beef. Ground beef, okay. Yep. Now, is there a ratio in that ground pork? Yes, so it's one third ground pork, two thirds ground beef. Um, uh, fat ratio, I believe, for, for the ground beef is 80-20. Mm -hmm. And then for the pork, I want to say is 70-30. Okay. All right, so obviously we're in your restaurant. A lot of people don't know that the restaurant's not quite open yet, but it will be soon, Absolutely. very, very soon. But Kyle's been running a very, very successful food truck for the past several years. And just tell, was the food truck always like you started culinary school and, and then you wanted to kind of yes. get into that? Like yes, you're like, absolutely. I know that's exactly what I'm doing. Yes. That's um, awesome. So yeah, from the start I wanted some sort of food truck. I didn't know if I was gonna do crepes or not, but it just kind of turned out that way and it's been, Super awesome ever since. That's awesome. Yeah. So we're getting ready to mix in an industrial mixer. You clearly don't have one of those at home. Hopefully you have a KitchenAid. If you don't, could be a little bit more of a struggle, but you definitely want some kind of stand mixer when you're doing that, something sturdy, a lot of weight. I'm a big dude, I can't even lift this thing up. But, uh, so food trucks. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people have seen food trucks. I mean, they've been around for years. Uh, here in Louisville, they're kind of a, definitely gaining traction. They've Absolutely. become kind of a big thing. But there are some misconceptions about food trucks. So, sure. so what are like some of the tips? Like, hey, that's a good food truck, or maybe it's not a good food truck. I mean, I'm sure you guys are a big fraternity. I'm sure you know a lot of the people, but I'm sure you know a lot of horror stories too. Absolutely, there's there's a lot of horror stories with food trucks. But um, food trucks in general are so much safer than the average person would say assume. Um, especially, for example, the sushi truck that's here in Louisville. When I first saw it, probably six, yeah, seven years ago, I, I was like, there's there was no one. way I'm eating sushi from a food truck. They're the sweetest, nicest, and, and like most food safe people that I know. That's and I awesome. love their food truck. That's great. Like, food trucks are safe. <laughs> I absolutely guarantee it. That's most awesome. of them. <laughs> so what are like some do's or don'ts maybe then? 
So like, obviously, all right, you look at that. And well, and now in, in Louisville, like you have to get a rating, right, from the Board yes, of Health? Yes, absolutely. They come in, they inspect the truck, Everything, all that. Everything, head to toe. But what if you walk up to a truck and, and maybe just it seems a little off, or maybe it smells a little funny? Sure, so one of the largest turnoffs for me for a food truck is if you walk up to that food truck and you can immediately smell the fryer grease. They should change that fryer grease at least once a week. So, so if you can smell that fryer grease, it's not been changed. So it's old. I would keep walking. There you go. All right, cool enough. All right, what's the next step? What, 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 what do you do next? Next step is to start cooking it. it. This is it. It's all mixed together. It's all nice and even. It's pretty. Absolutely. You should smell it, guys. It smells so good. <laughs> The question we're gonna to address today, is social security taxable? The simple answer is yes, but there's a lot of convoluted answers as to when it can be taxable and when it isn't going to be taxable. Then we always hear, when should I take social security? Well, that answer is very simple. You tell me when you're gonna die, and I can tell you when to take social security. But since more often than not, we don't know that answer, you need to get, or you should get, a social security analysis run, and then what it'll do is take all the variables and put them into a formula, and then you get to make an advised decision with some kind of financial professional. Now, regarding the taxation of social security, if you decide to take it early at 62, there's an income limit on how much you can generate and then they're going to start taxing it. Now, if you go for every $2 above it you go, they're gonna tax you at $1 of your benefit. And that doesn't even include whether or not you're gonna pay income taxes on it or not. Now, if you make below a certain threshold, you're not gonna be taxed at all. But as you get older, you know, if you're bringing in a pension and then you're gonna start bringing in income from maybe an IRA, then if you make too much money, they'll either tax you at 50% or they're gonna tax you at 85. So my advice would be to get with a financial professional, take a look at all the ramifications of it so you can make the most advised decision possible. Obviously we're making a really, really big batch here, but I heard you say 10 cups water, 10 cups milk, uh, two cups canola oil, yep. and then you're putting in 10 pounds of flour. Yep. So obviously if we dumb that down, we could do one cup milk, one cup water, looks like a quarter cup canola oil, one pound flour, and three eggs. I think that math works. I think so. Somewhere in that ballpark, but it, I would say that'll work. So when you, you, you learned how to make crepes in France or was it in Africa? So, so I learned how to make them at first in, um, in Mozambique, Africa. Okay, and then you just, was that like the first time you ever had a crepe? I think so, actually, yeah. <laughs> and you were just like, wow, man, I'm crepe, all in, in. I love it, I've yeah, gotta have it. Absolutely. And I just gotta learn how to do this. Mm -hmm. So when you came home, you're like, all right, that's it. And did you just start making crepes all the time, like for your family and for your wife? Or? So, uh, so, so not exactly, I just went to culinary school and, and sort of tried to hone a craft. Yeah, and did they have like a crepe day at culinary school? Were you like, didn't. I got this? I don't think I made a single crepe in culinary school. <laughs> of course yeah, not, right? Right. I'm super excited about today's show because I've actually never made a crepe and I've made a lot of food. I've made a lot of omelets. I've done a lot of things with egg. Never done this. So super excited about it. All right, so what I'm gonna do next, I'm gonna add the flour, but slowly, so it doesn't clump up. We can get a nice, uh, super even mixture, uh, especially with a uh, so a thin crepe, you don't want huge clumps in it, obviously. All right, I think we got our consistency. All right, so it looks good, yeah? So it is still so, pretty runny, it's not a pancake batter. That's what I was just gonna ask. So more runny than a pancake batter, more runny obviously than a waffle batter. Right. But looks good, so it's mm -hmm. yeah, kind of like a melted milkshake almost. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Crepes on, obviously you can see it had some nice consistency there. Uh, real quick, so if you're gonna do this at home, you're gonna want it on like medium, lowish heat on your burner. Uh, most people aren't gonna have a crepe pan. Most. So what would you suggest they use if they were gonna try to make a crepe? Some kind of s small nonstick uh, pan would be great for it. Okay. Uh, maybe like a, would a griddle maybe, like a flat griddle work? If you have this, Yes, absolutely. If you don't, I would recommend a pan so that you can just kind of... Just turn around because you want it yeah, really exactly. thin, yes. as thin as it can do spread across the whole surface. Right. All right, and then how do you know when to flip them or how do you know, like, you don't want them to brown, do you? Or do you want them to brown? A super 
light brown is okay. You don't want them dark at all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. You want nice uh, foldable and flexible crepes, not crackers. Gotcha. La Chandelure. Yeah. What is that? La Chandelure. So, so our name is derived from a French holiday in which they actually um, <laughs> so they eat crepes all day long on La Chandelure. Okay. So we're crepe day. Okay, crepe yeah. day. So what day is that? February second. February second. Nice. February 2nd, you have to eat crepes. Absolutely. So the restaurant's almost done. We're gonna have guests here pretty soon. Yep. What's gonna be on the menu? So are, yeah. are, obviously, we're gonna have crepes on the menu. We're gonna have a lot of crepes on the menu. We're gonna have some fries, some loaded fries as well, some more sides. We're gonna experiment with not higher end food, but more than just crepes and fries. Gotcha. Yeah. Awesome, okay, cool. And like you'll have a brunch, so I yes. think you'll figure something out with that. Absolutely. Have the ladies come in, get some mimosas. Oh, yeah. Things will be going. All right, are we gonna brown the meat now? Yes, we're gonna do the chorizo, if I can find it. It's still in our big bin. All right, so we were talking earlier, and Kyle had mentioned that when you make the, ch the chorizo blend, if you actually made it a little bit ahead of time, that vinegar will bind in there, and it'll actually like kind of like marinate a little bit, or ferment is a better word. And if you do that about two, three days in advance, it just makes the flavors better. Don't have to do that, but it'll make it a little bit better. Absolutely. All right, so we've got it. Nonstick pan. Looks like, I'd say it's about a half a pound in there of the, of the blend. And then uh, about medium high heat. I feel like well, what we're seeing in the kitchen, spice is kind of your thing. You like, you like some heat. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, so I like a lot of flavor. I don't gotcha. like it. Yeah. Doesn't matter what it is, as long as it packs a punch. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Ready to build crepes? We are ready to build a crepe. Let's do it. All right. So now do you build it on there? Yep, okay, absolutely. So we're gonna build the crepe, and then obviously you want that cheese to melt down oh, yeah. nicely. So you want to, that's a chihuahua yeah. cheese, by the way. Just like the dog's name, it's a Mexican cheese, great melting cheese. And you want to buy a shredded one. Uh, it tends to just melt down a little bit better than if you shredded it yourself. But he's just putting it on half because he's gonna fold some over. You don't want to overpower it with the cheese. So you got your pulled pork, what do you do with, how do you do your pulled pork? So our pork, we actually slow roast our butts over 12 hours and we make our own rub. Um, it's a coffee rub. Nice. And I use a lot of coffee in it because of all of the acid. It helps to break down all the fat and okay. everything else in there. It just makes it super nice and juicy. Yeah. And, and here's something that most people may not know. Pork butt actually comes from the shoulder area. It's actually part of the pork shoulder. You'd think the pork butt would be the butt, but that's actually the ham. So kind of backwards a little bit but slow roast the pork butt 12 hours that's easy set it in the oven forget it and then obviously a mixture of the chorizo you want the pork really is and if I miss speaking tell me but I think the pork is really what's gonna stand out in the dish the chorizo is gonna be a little bit more of a garnish just kind of have a little bit of that bite in the back exactly. of your mouth is that right exactly all right melted cheese pork show or pork butt slow roasted the chorizo house made and then the haber I can't even say that word. Hagerbadil. Hagerbadil pickles. But anyway, very nice, locally made, spicy, sweet, which is what we love, sweet heat, we talk about it all the time, pickles. Absolutely, there's a lot of acid in this dish, but it works and it's so good. All right, so our crepe is just about finished. It's starting to brown, if you guys can see. Yeah, nice so, light brown, like yep. gold in there. So now we're gonna sauce it. So first we have a mustard. It is one that we make ourselves. So what's in that mustard sauce? It is a bourbon mustard. Bourbon. And it is really, really good. So mustard, bourbon, if you like both of those, put them together. Can't go wrong there. And then we have a chipotle aioli sauce. Chipotle aioli. Aioli is a fancy way of mayo based, but it's got a nice, with the chipotle, you'll probably have a nice smoky taste to it, a little exactly. bit of heat in the back. And there it is. All right, guys, here you have it. It's our chorizo twist. There's chihuahua cheese and pulled pork, chorizo, the hagabardo pickles, the bourbon mustard and chipotle sauce in the center, and it's beautiful. Awesome. If you have any questions about this dish, or maybe you want to come on the show, email me at info at swdgroup.com. Kyle Thomas, executive chef, owner, La Chandelure Restaurant. I'm Rob D'Alessio, and this was A Taste of Retirement.